Maya, then Astra, then Fiona. Um, I'm just going to, oh, I also want to mention Anupa, who is also here this evening, who illustrated um, the very beautiful bioluminescent baby, which um, I think Luke is also going to put a, a link for the shop, the Guillemot shop in the chat at some point where you can go and see more of that. Um, hi, Anupa. Uh, okay, so I will start off by introducing Maya. Uh, Maya's poetry has been published in British, Irish, Canadian and American journals, including Poetry Ireland, Stand and the Missouri Review. Her debut collection, Overrun by Wild Boars, was published this summer by Flip Die. She was a finalist for the 2020 Brett Elizabeth Jenkins Poetry Prize, shortlisted for the 2020 Bridport Poetry Award and the 2020 Martin Crawford Prize in Poetry and the 2019 White Review Prize. Uh, she is beginning her MFA in creative writing at the University of Michigan, and I believe she's in Michigan at the moment. Um, and we're going to be working with Maya on a, a couple of things next year, which are quite exciting. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Maya now. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so wonderful to be here today. It's my 2 uh, p.m. And I just wanted to share with you all this wonderful thing that I've discovered, which is what fireflies look like. Um, so in the launch of Bioluminescent Baby, I had never seen fireflies before. And this is a new thing from this area of the United States. Um, so thank you all for being here. I'm really excited and really uh, happy. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to read from my debut collection, Overrun by Wild Boars, which was published in July with Flip Tie. Um, and I'm going to begin with the first poem in the collection, which is from a section called The Price of Tenderness. Um, and this poem is called Cochineal Wings. Cochineal Wings. One. Today I'm four and go to market with my mother. She buys lilies for the imaginary pool I color in, cuts grapefruit skin into boats, unzips the coat of each segment and lays them down. Naked bodies on floating rafts, waxy limbs protect us from sinking, how skin survives a boat ride. Two. Tonight I read about monarch butterflies flying south each year, 3,000 miles from Canada to Mexico, from milkweed to wildflower. Not one completes the journey. America is full of gossamer carcasses flitting between falling bullets. There is nothing of butterfly in my mother. I stop believing in symbols. Three. Lately I'm concerned by wings. A week after my grandmother dies, I dream a head emerges from my own womb, ashen, except its lips, at which a tattooed starling is fixed in cochineal. Insect wings ground up for paste. Later, I begin EMDR treatment. I am cold as a fish memory of the time it takes to cross the Atlantic twice and end up right where I started, with a woman yelling, Go back to where you come from, her words purpling the dusk. Thank you, everyone. Um, my family home growing up was one of kind of multiple religions and multiple cultures. Um, so this next poem, um, which is called Born in the Year of the Ball, um, it's kind of about that and about the myths we are told as children about origins. Um, the poem includes the story of Vishnu, um, who transforms into a giant ball in order to save the world, which was an important uh, myth uh, for my family growing up. Um, and this book is really kind of a song of mourning for the lives and stories and communities that have been destroyed and the archives that have been lost through colonialism, through genocide, through the plundering of the land. Um, and the central question is kind of what do we do with this world we have inherited? How do we find intimacy in the face of a history of violence and, of course, of ongoing violence? Um, so the wild boar in this book is kind of this ambivalent figure um, because boars are these ferocious creatures that are capable of attacking, but on the other hand, they're also prey animals um, hunted by predators. So in the book, there is this question of to what extent are we like the wild boar, aggressive, always causing havoc um, and harmful, but also capable of care and compassion and, and also generosity. Um, so this is born in the year of the boar and it's the Sestina. 
To begin breath in the year of the ball is to be wise, my mother tells me. And later I learn, aside from humans, pigs are the only animal that go to the forest purposefully and get drunk. Father tells me of Vishnu, diving into the sea to rescue Budevi, earth goddess who creates a world where all of us can imagine and create new origin myths. Vishnu as a wild boar, he has many avatars walking across the sea, Jesus and Buddha also, reincarnations. I learn, some choose to incorporate, not reject, the drunk evening taking everything in, unsated, animals squabbling behind the bins, two lovers, animal grasp and gasp of skin, turn secrets created in dilated eyes of sparkling girls, long drunk, on beer. Booze, the first commodity we boars took when lockdown was announced. We learned what society couldn't live without as the sea thrashed against the shore, uncaring. The sea holds its violence in check, releases an animal breath. I count one to nine, then repeat. I learn deep breathing, try stillness, try creating it by switching off my phone. I think of boars running free, Remember running free and drunk that summer. I dream of holding you drunk on touching and closeness, of falling to the sea bottom and breathing deep as Vishnu, the boar, forages the seafloor among forest and animal for what does not belong to ocean. My sister creates a paper swan to float as long as paper lasts. I learn to cry at petals falling and fallen fireflies. I learn that letting go is nothing like the movies and the drunk artist on the corner provides no answer as he creates an echo of constellations. There will always be sea rising, the cry of gulls as waves drown animals and promises of shelter and the coarse cries of wild boars as they create a nest for their young to learn that safety is temporary. The bulls, inebriated by the drunk sea, drown their cubs, an animal inundation of spume. Uh, carrying on with the sea theme, this next poem is called From the Boat Window Foam Lapping. Um, and it's about our complicity as humans within these big structures of violence. Um, and I'm also really interested in complicity of language. What does it mean to use beautiful words to aestheticize suffering? What is our role uh, of, as witnesses of that suffering? Um, and in which ways can that be a voyeuristic relationship um, often? So this is uh, from the boat window, foam lapping at edges. You and I discuss pyrotechnics, white, shattering blue. Someone lights a fuse, sparks like goldfish. Is this another world now breaking into hours, slicing the night and everything bleeding out now raw and beautiful? Come with me and collapse, our bodies burnt and new. I want you as crabs need to scuttle over coat caps. You count labels, advertising, Evian, Mountain Valley Spring, the genuine water company, flasks tossed like bait, fluorescent cans. The urine colored bags collide like jellyfish. There are no jellyfish, no Naples, no Netherlands, no Shanghai. We have the word coral and the colour, but not the monk seal's hum finding its mate. And as calcium carbonate dissolves and the shell of tiny shrimp disintegrates, you order dressed prawns with crisps. This is how we went to war with ocean, lover by lover. Now in search of turtles, we find only floating plastic and buy it, cigarette butts bent like lips and a dead penguin board your caressed. Um, thanks. <laughs> Those two poems were quite bleak. Um, so I'm gonna read now a poem, which is kind of my manifesto for hope um, that despite all the terrible ways humans have treated each other and continue to do so, um, there remains the possibility of real connection um, and real intimacy. Um, I wrote this poem in April, 2020. Um, so during the first stage of the pandemic and Thinking back to this past year in which there's been so much loneliness um, 
it's also really humbling to remember the many examples of kind of community action of people calling each other to check in um, of finding new ways to remind each other that kind of everyone is there um, so I mentioned the saber tree in this poem, which for many communities in Mexico, which is where my mum is from, um, it's the tree of life. So roots are thought to connect to the underworld. The trunk represents the middle world where the humans live and the upper branches are said to connect to the overworld and the 13 levels of heaven, which the Mayan, um, sorry, the 13 levels in which the Mayan heaven is divided. So spirits actually sit on the branches. Um, and because this poem is kind of a love song to our interconnectedness and our need for each other um, and, and kind of dependence is something hopeful, I wanted to share it here in thanks for this evening, which is my afternoon, <laughs> and in thanks for Luke um, for inviting me, for Astra and for Fiona, and thanks for this beautiful book, Bioluminescent Baby, um, that is coming into the world um, in all its magnificence. Love song for the tightrope walkers. For they rebuild the nests of starling and hummingbird, feed the wolf cub who's lost its mother, afraid of its own shadow. For they too are considered less important when the wind blows unwelcome, stocking supermarket shelves before agreed shifts in cabaret bars. Sammy balances on one hand and strips, takes back tips to his boyfriend, saves some for the sequin girl with the ill grandpa, who's short on rent. Each night she unfurls her wings, falls and flies, transforms this audience of skeptics and unbelievers. Do you hear the white river rush from the source, the shuffling cry of morning? I have seen the coral snake outrun its skin, the mangrove soak up the swamp, the saber roots retake each brick and bone the Mayans leave behind. They'll chart a course to sunlight, from maize leaf to lily pad, when you and I have gone to dark. And in that faded starlight, Hakaranda spirits wake. Um, and because I began with a butterfly poem, I thought I would just close with a butterfly poem also. Um, so this one is called, I Cannot Promise You an Eternity. And it's about my maternal great grandmother who went to Mexico as a refugee from Germany um, with her six year old son, my grandfather, um, kind of during the Nazi uh, time. Uh, I think a lot about the debt we owe to the past, um, who are the people who have come before us, upon whose shoulders we stand. Um, I cannot promise you an eternity of love. You sing to me the last time I see you. You are mostly tubes and purple veins. You write, and I hold steady your frail fingers clutching the pen. Tell me again of your arrival in Mexico in 1935, of whom you left behind. I ask, does it bother you to be blind? I am stupid and seven years old. You are concerned by the disappearance of butterflies. I lose the paper message you write, I think, on the 12-hour flight back, but I can't be sure. I admit this to my mum on my 24th birthday. Buscalo. Maybe it will turn up somewhere. Someone writes, all lost things end up on the moon. Tell me about the prison in Germany. Tell me so I can record the name you shed so the others wouldn't find you. My friend holds a full moon ritual in which we burn what we wish to forget. You receive a death threat on a Tuesday afternoon. Put it in the third drawer down with all the others, you say. In the last days, you speak only German. None of us understand. In Mexico City, I find someone to translate the words you mumble in sleep. Are there enough butterflies in all the world? for all the flowers. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so excited to hear everyone else's poems. Thank you, Maya. That was, that was just really lovely. It was really lovely to hear you read and especially, especially your hope-filled poem, but everything was gorgeous. Um, I, I'll move on to introducing Astra now. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Astra. 
Uh, Astra is a PhD researcher and tutor at the University of Surrey, with a focus on the experimental tradition across poetry, visual arts and performance. She is currently exploring sculptural poetics as a revolutionary act in the context of the Anthropocene. Yes, I took that from your website, Astra. <laughs> Astra is the author of several books, including Stargazing, which we published in 2019, and is still available from um, the Guillemot website, if uh, I think Luke might put that link up now. Um, uh, but we'll also be publishing um, Astra's debut collection, Constellations, early next year. I'm very excited about that. She is the founder of Poem Atlas, which publishes and exhibits visual poetry and she is currently in Greece with her latest poem Atlas exhibition and I think the title is Textiles Astra is that correct cool yeah, okay and I'm gonna hand yeah. over to Astra well first of all um just to say a huge thank you to Luke and Sarah for the invitation uh, uh, I'm so oh, I feel so honored to be part of the celebration of bioluminescent baby um, yep, yeah, so thanks to you, Fiona, as well, and to Maya for this wonderful reading. Like Sarah mentioned, I, uh, the Hope poem at the end was my favorite. And now my little warning before I start. Um, like Sarah and Luke mentioned before, I'm in Greece, so I hope, I really hope that there won't be any breaks and, you know, the, my phone um, internet connection will behave. So, yeah, that's that. So um, also Sarah mentioned um, Stargazing, which was uh, published a few years back, and my debut collection, Constellations, uh, that's coming up next year. And so I thought, you know, with that stellar theme that we have, well, that I have sort of going um, in the air with Guillermo, that sort of stellar tie that we have, um, I thought um, to start with a uh, stellar themed uh, poems uh, from Crescent Earth. And that's a chapbook that was published at the start of the year uh, by Broken Sleep Books. And I should say that the poems are written about Earth from the perspective of other planets. Innermost from Mercury. Floating terrace, far but so close, on the edge of solar shoreline. For a change from Jupiter, 365 million miles between me and you to mark discretion. As a drifter, blown far from you, yet you're always there. Tell us is the horizon from sun, triggering a new finality into that of center blue green. Before us, you grow homeward nearness. Anticipatory from Venus. Spin slowly, but now. Moves like forward, inhaled in you exude attraction. Counter future from Mars. You speak of futurity and potential elsewhere. I speak of inaction, tearing you to almost certain emergency. A rare pendulum from Saturn. Seeing Earth is like seeing a sphere of hanging light. Mosaic from Uranus. Spinning. Spinning pulse, twist and dance around the curves it seeks refuge. 
And that's the last one from the sequence called Metamorphoses from Neptune. Moving earth fields caught in moving blue, moment to moment lands caught in manic range of moving blue. Earth drifts, earth drifts the planet, earth shines the green, concrete blue drifts creating momentum. So uh, that was Crescent Earth, and I'm not, now going to move on to a, um, an object poem. So um, it's um, called, sorry, I have to look <laughs> uh, Leaf Laurel in the Memory of Bees. And that's um, the one exhibited now in the um, Rhodes exhibition, um, which I'm curating is my first international exhibition. So I'm so, so excited. And I can see loads of contributors in here. So uh, Susie, Nadira, amazing. Uh, so yeah, that's my piece uh, from the exhibition. So um, I don't usually make big introductions about my work, but I will for this work, because I feel like it, it may sort of add an interesting layer to the reading. So. Um, this uh, laurel has been um, made with letricid. I don't know if you can see it. It was a, um, a method of letter transferring that sort of, I think it emerged in the 1970s. And um, it's been applied on hand-dyed skeleton leaves. And uh, I've used a plant-dyed um, silk habitat ribbon. Uh, the text uh, featured, so each leaf features a line of what I'm going to read in a minute. Um, and it's inspired by uh, Bob Cobbins, this is a square poem. So what um, Cobbin does in this uh, poem is that he uses those five words in the title, this is a square poem, as a word bank for, um, for the poem. And uh, each line is um, comprised of different versions of combinations of, um, of, of that title. And I should say, whilst I'm in Greece, um, the tie with Greece, uh, obviously I'm Greek uh, in Greece at the moment. And uh, so the laurel as a symbol, as I'm sure you know, um, you know it's a symbol of um, glory used back in the, you know, in ancient Greece, but also a symbol of mourning um, as, um, you know, it's used in Western, you know, in, in Western, in a Western sen sense. And um, I've used that symbol. I thought it was uh, very appropriate um, for, for um, to tie with the content um, because what I was trying to do was to um, show respect to the bees um, of, of today, which are in massive, and uh, yeah, that's, that's just to say sorry from humanity, but also to glorify, you know, their beauty. So I'm just going to wear the wreath. Why not? I thought, you know, um, I'm just going to check it's all right. Yeah. And then read you the content. And I should say that um, the transcription is, is the suggested transcription, because obviously you as a viewer seeing the object poem, you can then, you know, mix and match the lines as appropriate. For you. Leaf laurel in the memory of bees. This is a leaf laurel in the memory of bees. A laurel of bees. This is a bees. A leaf laurel. This is a bees laurel. A leaf laurel. A memory of bees. A bees laurel. This is a laurel. A memory of leaf. Of laurel of leaf, uh, a leaf of bees, a memory. Laurel this is, a leaf, a memory of, bees of, a laurel of leaf. This laurel of bees, in this memory of leaf bees. This is a, a leaf laurel in the memory of bees. Thank you everyone. And I hope I didn't break. Fingers crossed. Only a, only a very little bit. Um, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Astra. 
I'm very uh, proud to say that I actually own one of Astra's laurels because um, <laughs> she sent it to me and it's just gorgeous. Um, thank you, Astra. It's my pleasure now to introduce the um, to introduce Fiona. Um, Fiona has published two collections, both of which were shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. Bright Travellers, which won the 2015 Jeffrey Faber Memorial Prize, and the Seamus Heaney Centre for Poetry's Prize for First Full Collection. And Vertigo and Ghost, which was shortlisted for the 2019 Rathbones Folio Prize and won the Roehampton Poetry Prize, and the Forward Prize for Best Collection. The poems in Bioluminescent Baby were created during her University of Exeter Urgency Arts Commission, 2018 to 20, and the images in Bioluminescent Baby were created by the extraordinarily, extraordinarily talented Anupa Gardner. And we're thrilled to have her read for us this evening. Um, I will hand over to Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here tonight with us. Um, it's been terrific to hear Maya and Astra, such beautiful readings. And um, Astra, I feel like some of your breakups added to the poems, that you had these poems from crossing interplanetary distances, and it felt like your words were crossing those distances. It, it was beautiful. Um, and Maya, as you've got such a rich zoology going on. I feel like I feel like we were meant to be as a reading trio. <laughs> um, and thank you also so much to Luke and Sarah for publishing this beautiful book. Um, I don't think I've ever had a poem illustrated before. Uh, so uh, Luke said, yes, they would take this book. And then and then apparently he likes making things really difficult and expensive for himself because then uh, he got lots of uh, design ideas and got Anupa to do, Anupa Gardner, who's with us tonight, to do these beautiful woodcut illustrations for it, which are just stunning. And also... Um, just chime so nearly with my experience that I think Anupa might be psychic as well. So like this one, I don't know if you can see this, but this is one of my, well, I think they're all my favorites, but this is a firefly wood. And uh, it's just so like the firefly wood that I visited. But uh, yeah, I think she has psychic abilities. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read you some of these poems. They were all about bugs. They were commissioned by, as Sarah said, by uh, Arts and Culture at the University of Exeter um, and uh, written. The research was done in collaboration with two sound producers, um, Maya Bosworth and Eliza Lomas. So we went and kind of learned about bugs and uh, interviewed scientists and sometimes recorded bugs um, and trying to record uh, cicadas. Maya encountered a snake in a field. So I think I've put her off field research for life. But anyway, I should read you some of these, these poems. I'm going to start um, with the first one that I wrote for this series, which is about um, our own glowworms, um, which actually we have some locally in our lanes, but I didn't know that at the time. So Maya and I went searching elsewhere and didn't find any, but um, so this, yeah, so this poem is about um, a glowworm I encountered a long time ago. So um, the interesting thing about glowworms is they spend their lives as larvae, kind of sucking the juices out of snails, and then um, they emerge as glowworms and their, their one function then is, is to mate. So uh, they don't even have mouth parts, which I found uh, quite morbid, I guess. <laughs> Love poem, Lampyridae. The female born again with little changed, except she has no mouth and may not eat, except she has this urge to climb, this light she must raise and twist. The male born again with little changed, except he has no mouth, except he has this urge to search and wings. 
Oh, she must twist and turn her tail's green fire like bait, its little stab of brightness in the night. And he must search with wings through troubled air to find her pinhole lure, its single green seducing star. All night she signals him in. Come find me, it is time and almost dawn. All night he looks for her in petrol stations, villages and homesteads, the city's neon signs. Where are you? It is time and almost dawn. Once were humans wandered in the lanes, led astray by fairies, foxfire, who found their stranger selves and brought them home. Now the dark is drowned, but some things you can only find beyond the light, and it is time and almost dawn and love, my love, there is no finding then. Um, so the problem uh, with glowworms is that they need no, uh, they don't need light interference because that distracts them. The male glowworms think the lights are females and go wandering off in the wrong direction. Um, so it's strange the many ways in which we pollute the world. Um, in ways that we can't even imagine sometimes. But um, I think, yeah, maybe that's something constructive we can do, turn our, turn our outdoor lights out. Um, and then um, I'm going to read a, quite a long poem about mosquitoes. And mosquitoes were my big stumbling block for celebrating bugs, because I really hate them and um, they love me. And, uh, but also on a more serious note, they're responsible for the spread of disease, um, dengue fever, and uh, particularly malaria, um, which is just a massive killer. Um, and I think it's been really instructive how quickly we have found ways to deal with COVID and how very, very long it has taken us to find ways to deal with malaria. Um, so I'm going to read this long poem and then I'll read one more short one and then that will be me. Mosquitoes, Mozambique. How we collectively itch under their collective wine. All night insects thicken round the clinic's outdoor light. In the malaria ward, the beds are pushed so close, the sleepers share the same bad dream. A female mosquito filling her soft bulb, dipping her beak for a drop of blood to ripen her eggs. How her abdomen's rosé flush deepens to ruby as she siphons out water as waste. The sleepers parch. Over at the NGO dorm, we swap mosquito law like cards. They become accustomed to, or are indifferent to, or possibly mock citronella. They'll find a way in. Even the smallest tear in a mosquito net is an open door, and your body is a welcome mat on which they wipe their feet before inserting a straw. They use two serrated needles to cut through your tissues, two needles to hold the flesh apart, one to insert a chemical spit to keep your blood running, and a proboscis to home in, to suck. Their eyesight's alleged to be poor. They see you better when you move and are attracted to blondes and restless sleepers. They smell your breath. Some of us smell sweeter. 
I'm one of their chosen ones and verge on paranoia. Long sleeves, trousers tucked into socks after dark, a cotton scarf to protect the back of my neck. My lips tingle with deet. If I lick them, my tongue bitters and numbs. I brush at my face obsessively, keep my feet tucked under me and chafe. I'm not the only one. Out on the veranda, the Dutch intern swipes an electric racket through the air. Every time it intercepts an insect, it makes an exaggerated buzz. It pleases him to hear them frizz, to imagine their bodies forked in hot blue light as they electrocute and spasm. Like Deet, his bat is indiscriminate and zaps fruit flies, crane flies, moths, beetles on the wing. Think of insecticide sprayed over cities from plains, falling mist fine over ditches, a soft particulate rain, the sweltering night suddenly quiet in the city park, the frogs' pale bellies moonside up, snakes like sloppy inner tubes rotting in the grass. And think of Honesty's daughter, hallucinating in bed as Honesty loosens her cornrows with trembling fingers and sings to her in undertones collapsed by her own uneven breath the nearest clinic hours away on broken roads. The malaria swells and burns till her girl arches from her pallet bed and drums her heels, her eyes rolled back in her head, raised beyond and gone. Though her mother tries to call her home, daughter, baby girl. It makes me sick to write this as if I make it happen, but every two minutes, a child. Survivors sway in the open bed of the hired trucks, ululating and screaming as they rattle to the burial ground. Meanwhile, Imo Hansen, merciful professor, inserts his naked wrist through the sleeved net tunnel of a mosquito incubator a special iridescent species, and suffers them to feed, keeps steady despite the itch, because these rainforest jewels might have secrets to tell. And in London, a woman splices a mosquito egg to corrupt the gene that defines male sex. There will be infertile males, and in eight generations, a matter of days, the brood will collapse. Still, my architect friend on the Ilia sleeps in one bed with his Mozambican wife and sons. He jolts awake every few minutes to check that his wife and boy's beloved flesh isn't touching the net or near the net or within arm's length of the net where he imagines a mosquito might intrude its fine needle. Again and again he shuffles them in, till they sleep in a riddled heap at the centre of the bed, swimming in the vast margins of his terror. I don't have children yet, though I have miscarried and hold myself like a crystal glass, full to the brim, afraid to spill, afraid to harm a single ovum. When I'm feverish, I take myself to the hospital and cue to have my finger pricked in the whitewashed clinic. Hundreds of mothers mill outside the slow pharmacy. Pills are passed at intervals through a metal grill. Babies are weighed on clock-faced scales suspended from the ceiling lane in dangling knotted slings, the way in old cartoons, newborns are brought in bundles, hanging from a stork's beak, the longed for gift. The man driven insane by dysentery, 
turmeric yellow shit dribbling down his leg, stirs in the hospital garbage with a stick and won't let anyone come near. My name is called. I've tested negative and can go. I walk, shaking with relief and fever, back to the dorm, back through aircon buses and airports and planes, back to my privileged Northern Isle in which my babies will be inoculated against most ills and God willing, inshallah, whatever it takes I will give, will live. I do not deserve this life. Um, and I just want to read one last poem. Am I doing okay for time, Luke? That one seems to go on forever. <laughs> I need a rest, holiday. <laughs> um, so I might finish with Mama Cockroach for just a bit of a change in tone, but is that okay? Um, so this is a slightly funnier one, although um, cockroaches were another of my sticking points writing about bugs, because I really don't like cockroaches much either. Um, and I had to find a way to celebrate one of the creatures of the world that I don't find particularly lovely, but of course they're all part of this amazing ecosystem that we live in. So this is Mama Cockroach, I love you. Because you cozy with the aunties in your reeking slums and are intimate and sweet. Because you begrudge no one a meal, but ooze a fecal trail to lead your commune to its source like a dirty bee. Because you are joyfully promiscuous. Because you pouch your young and hide them in the sweaty creases of the house near superating food so they'll hatch to a feast or keep your eggs with you in a special purse shaped like a kidney bean and clutch it fast, or reinsert them into your abdomen and womb them there, or carry them as yolks and give live birth, then feed your pale brood secretions from your anus or your armpit glands like milk, or Deep in the flesh of a rotten log, pass them a bolus of pre-digested food mouth to mouth. Because you suffer your young to swarm upon your back and do not flinch or buck them off, but carry them like a human playing horsey with her children down on hands and knees, decrying the swag of her own loose flesh because you twirl your antennae gracefully to test your crawl space, because strokingly you caress your offspring's backs and gentle them with pretty pheromones and chirps, because you purr when your young stroke your face, because you would leave your body for your offspring to dine upon, all the liquors and gravy of the obscene world, your work in the crannies delivered to the living, because you are, despite all rumours, mortal. And what if you are crushed before your eggs can be delivered? What if your sisters drive you hissing out? What if your kitchen is fumigated? What if the mongoose the lizard, the snake, a muscular tongue prying at the warm and greasy interstices of your stubborn occupancy takes you in its mouth. Someone must care for the dirt. Thank you. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you, Maya and Astra. Um,
this has been one of my favorite readings. It's, it's, it's really, really lovely. Fiona's book was one that we saw straight away and, and, and fell in love with. Um, for those of you who follow our books a little bit, you'll obviously see why. Um, it was absolutely stunning. We've got um, some brilliant comments coming in, actually comments for all three readers. Actually, two things I want to do. One is I'm going to read back some of the comments while um, people uh, come up with any questions you might have. If you have questions, please uh, just pop them in the chat um, or send them directly privately to me as I've had one or two now. Um, if you don't want to sort of make it public. The other thing I want to do is just to show and I'll paste it into uh, the chat again. Um, so uh, we've got Fiona's book, which I put a couple of links to as, as the evening's been going on. Uh, we've also got on the website um, Anupa's works. We've got, it's a really limited edition, very small print, I think it was 12 or something like that. Um, woodcuts, the original woodcuts prints, um, and they're for sale on the website too, uh, on our a new sort of artwork page we've done. So I'll just put that in the chat there. And if you want to have a look at the pictures um, or buy the pictures, then, then um, there they are, 15, thank you, Anupa. <laughs> uh, direct message correcting me, brilliant, thank you. Um, so yeah, we've had, as some questions come in, I think they will do, um, we had uh, some really nice comments. Maya at the beginning, for lovely Sistina, such a natural flowing use of the form. That was from Trelawney. We've got some great poets in here tonight as well, including Chaucer, apparently. Um, uh, we had another one that was so moving from Nadira and later haunting as well for Maya. Wonderful, so wonderful to hear you again. That was Chaucer. Um, wow, Maya, beautiful from Kali, 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 uh, beautiful reading from Susie, such a rich zoology, uh, and what a tremendous moving last poem, that's from Fiona for Maya. Um, Camilla Nelson, beautiful Maya, thank you. Uh, wonderful image launching poems from Rose, um, and beautiful from Laura. Lots and lots of really great stuff coming in, so it, it's, it's great. Um, vibrant lines full of love from Elsbieta, and again for Astra, uh, such gorgeous work from Susie. Um, gorgeous again from Nadira, just lovely Astra. Uh, that was wonderful Astra from Anna. The leaf laurel is beautiful. People like the leaf laurel Astra. Um, is Astra still there? Oh, thanks, Gary. Oh, there you are. Good. Sorry, I thought I, I can see you there for a minute. Um, uh, I was wondering if I was, yeah, talking to the word. Um, good to see the poem worn. People love the laurel. Good to see the poem worn, worn. and a little time lagging went very well, Elspeth said, and I agree with that. It did work quite nicely, especially when you're talking about the long distances. Um, and fantastic reading, Astra from Rose. That was great, Astra. Thank you from Anupa. Anupi, there was a nice one as well. Your woodcuts are so beautiful from Maya. Um, we sent Maya and Astra the text to have a look at too. Um, and we've got lots that have come in for Fiona. Um, that I didn't have time to write down, but I will read some of them out. I saw Swoon, What an Opening from Kali, that was good. Uh, beautiful again from Trelawney. Uh, a nice and interesting one from um, Camilla too, that COVID's been a real lesson giver in how we should hate the disease rather than the carrier, which I thought was interesting. Um, and well, well, gosh, such a lot uh, have come in. I won't be able to read all those. Uh, oh my goodness, that's vast from Chaucer. Uh, these are extraordinary, such rich images, luscious, delicious languages, so moving all-encompassing from Maya, so powerful and heartbreaking, uh, so extraordinary, put me in a troubled trance from Nadira, from Nadira. that's nice, um, such a compelling reading from Susie, um, so haunting and beautiful from Anupa, um, wonderful movement between human and non-human Fiona, so attentive, sorry to be late from Linda, <laughs> uh, and uh, what a trio of readers uh, from Chaucer, which I completely agree with. Um, amazing poem, so gorgeous, so fantastic, thank you, gorgeous. Team Cockroach from Eric, um, stunning poems. And here's a question, a first question that I've got uh, that's come from a direct message, which is, uh, I haven't read it yet, so let's see what happens. Did you have a list of, Fiona, did you have a list of insects you wanted to write about? And if so, did any prove particularly tricky? And actually, so there's, I've had another uh, one come in that, we had, that was kind of connected to that. Um, yeah, which is around, is it harder to write about less charismatic insects like mosquitoes? Um, yes and no. So um, to begin with, um, there were certain insects I wanted to write about, like um, fireflies, mostly because I really wanted to see them. I meant to say, uh, Maya, that I'm... I want, uh, yeah, I should have read you the firefly poem because they're so beautiful, aren't they? Um, and also because they were for sound pieces, we did have this 
focus slightly on insects that made noise, but that's quite hard. <laughs> so we did, you know, we went and researched cicadas and um, field crickets and that kind of thing because they make a noise. But actually, although although some insects I don't know if any of them are less charismatic in the end. Once you once you research them, they've got the weirdest possible lives and um, go through all these metamorphoses and are kind of just every insect really is weird and wonderful and has its own charisma. Even even cockroaches and you you know even mosquitoes. I mean, one thing I learned was that there are only you know there are thousands thousands of different kinds of mosquitoes and actually only a couple of them are carriers. So we kind of give them a bad name. Um, but the life the life cycles of insects I found endlessly fascinating because they'll start as something completely different. I don't know if you've ever dug in your garden and found leather jacket grubs that then turn into crane flies. I mean the the differences between their infant form or their you know their first forms and their last forms are just bizarre. Yeah, so they're all they're all interesting and charismatic in the end, even if they do give you the creeps to begin with. <laughs> Uh, I quite like there was a comment there. I can almost love cockroaches from Patricia. Um, <laughs> wonderful reading. I can almost love cockroaches. I think there was a question for Anupa there somewhere. There was, yeah. I'm going to go to that one now, which is from Rose. Um, Anupa, are you happy answering a little question? Uh, the question is, how did the images emerge in your mind? Did the poem suggest woodcut to you as a medium? Uh, they're very beautiful and seem to really capture the quiet strength of the poems. Thanks, a bit there. Um, well, I read all of Fiona's poems, and I think, um, um, yeah, I think, you know, when you sort of read something, you sort of, uh, you're forming images in your head, and they're so strong, the images that, um, they're very visual poems, I have to say. Um, so, yeah, those were the images that came to my head. <laughs> Um, and woodcuts because um, I work a lot with with relief prints, um, and there's something quite primitive about it. Um, and I just thought that would work really well. I mean, to be honest, even Luke um, is the one who actually suggested woodcuts, uh, <laughs> um, so we sort of went with woodcuts. I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's yeah. great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. Um, yeah, they, you. It, it, was, it was lovely to see these, these coming in um, and seeing the process as well. And we present some of the, um, I think, that, I, I don't know, were they sort of drafts and sketches and, and just the works in progress? It was really fascinating to, to see. Um, we've had a couple more questions coming in as well. There's a question here from Nadira for all three poets. Uh, which is, I think you each handled sensitive ecological topics amazingly well, uh, deftly and originally. What tactics, if any, did you adopt in order to avoid sentimentality and or didacticism? Should we start with, um, with Maya on that one? Um, <laughs> good question um, and interesting one to think about. Um, I think for me, kind of what was really um, like really in my mind is the ways in which we can be seduced by language um, in comparison with like the really troubling sides of um, the way that the world is going. Um, and so what is it to kind of, you know, um, I, I remember one time I was actually in Greece and um, on a bay and I saw behind me this like flash of red and it was actually a forest fire. Um, so it was this like terrible thing and it drew a line across the bay in a way that was like a paintbrush and it was a kind of um, being aware of on the one hand this thing that can be quite beautiful if you are separated from it and also completely tragic at the same time and thinking about all the ways in which um, there are all these kind of strange um, contradictions in the way that we experience life um, and I go I think about that moment I think I was about eight I was quite young and I think I saw that red line before I realized what it was so there was a gap between before being like whoa look at this extraordinary thing the firework um, and then realizing oh my god this is a look how fast it's moving this is actually horrifying and so scary um, so I'm not sure that answered your question but I guess just being aware of 
kind of um, all the ways in which um, what we experience cuts against each other and, and is kind of incompatible and complex and um, kind of difficult to, to put into a neat box to know what to do with it almost, kind of the contradictions, I guess. Thank you. Astrid, do you want to have a go at this one as well? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Nadira, for this uh, great question. And I should say Nadira is, very, is a very keen bee poet as well, aren't you, Nadira? Like me, you love bees from um, what I know. Um, uh, so yeah, at the moment, I would say, um, yeah, I can agree with, um, with Fiona that, uh, yeah, I love all insects as well. Um, and uh, at the moment, I'm focusing on bees, as you probably gathered. Um, I think what I try to, to keep in mind while writing poems about insects, um, and I, I suppose I'm using, you know, my sort of bees approach at the moment, because that's um, an insect that's sort of taking all of my headspace at the moment, is to just try and um, find out as much as I can and for this insect to not misrepresent it and to just, just uh, see, try to, you know, take on, sort of show all the layers, you know, of the awesomeness of these, um, of bees, for example, you know, in, in that example that I've brought. Um, but also to try and, um, I think through research to pick up um, the language that would sort of curate almost, um, you know, a, sort of list of words and, you know, uh, ideas around these um, insects that makes them unique. And then um, through that language, um, try and work with rhythm on the poem to, you know, um, to try and um, recreate that rhythm that that particular insect um, has in the poem as well. Um, so yeah, that's my approach. Um, with bees at the moment. They're just beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Fiona? Yeah, well, I was just thinking about um, Astra's laurel and how it kind of does enact that kind of uh, kind of fragmented mind of the hive, this, the, all these little minds working on the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think, well, I don't know, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, so I think what I mean, partly what this question is about is anthropomorphizing. And I think I'm, I am quite often in danger of that. Um, and I've kind of, I've kind of in the end decided not to care because about whether I'm anthropomorphizing or not, because clearly I am human and I understand things in a human way. And as much as I try to, I'm never going to uh, not see, you know, see through a glass darkly or whatever. I'm always going to see through this human this lens of being human and um I think I just in a way I just go with it I'm afraid I think if I worried too much about it then I'd be censoring myself um and try you know um I think being well researched or trying to research well like Astra said um hopefully helps because the thing you know the things you find out about insects are so weird um yeah, that's probably all I have to say about that, Luke. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I think we're coming. There's one. There's had a couple of questions in. One actually in the direct message, which are both for Astra actually, and around the laurel, and one in the one that's been directed to everyone. So maybe I should pose two at once, if that's all right, Astra, about the laurel. Um, so one in the uh, direct messages was uh, Laurel is a celebration and wreath is mourning. How does this relate to how you think about the Anthropocene stroke climate emergency? And then we had another one on the Laurel from Susie, if that one wasn't big enough a question, um, for did you find making the Laurel wreath object poem push the text in directions you hadn't expected? Oh, love these. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll try to focus and answer as much as I can. So with the first one, I think, yes, the um, the wreath as a symbol is definitely, um, well, in my mind, tied with um, 
the geological era that is the Anthropocene, um, I feel that um, the mourning, mourning aspect is, um, I don't know if, if people feel this way, but you know, um, there is a sense of pessimism that uh, there's no going back. Um, and, you know, a sense of sadness of, well, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you all um, can agree with that. Uh, there's a sense of sadness um, and, you know, also mourn, mourning for all the, um, you know, animals and humans um, and nature in general that are um, victims of the, our, our current state. Um, but also I think that, um, because of because the wreath is also tied with um as i said you know with with um, the idea of glory um hope i think that's that that um that golden thread of hope in the object poem that um you know nature is beautiful and you know we are beautiful and you know we should celebrate uh nature um and you know through that celebration um hopefully you know that that's a hope of the world being a better place because we're more more sensitive um you know with the environment that surrounds us so that's number one and i think number two was it so how the object form helped um or if it took the work into a new direction right and i think it definitely did i think um there is a page uh page based you know that suggested transcript which which goes with the with the three dimensional work um but i think what the object form brings is that sense of freedom to the reader and you know it's kind of almost you as a poet giving out you know that control of you know how the the sequence of the uh, what you know so you know because a lot of the the lines are almost lost um you know they're overlapping and so the the uh reader has to put a bit of an effort to kind of you know read each leaf anyway so um yeah so I, I think that that um spontaneity and interactivity is what I like about object poems and I saw one comment of someone that said that um they haven't seen an object poem before and it's so amazing I mean um I would definitely suggest that you look into this form um you know it's my favorite as you I think a lot of you you know there's loads of friends in the in the audience tonight but yeah I would definitely urge you to look into Thank you very much. I think that's probably most of the questions that we've had uh, that, that we've, we've managed to get through. So um, I just want to thank, uh, well, thank everyone for coming. I'll thank that in public in the chat as well. And uh, thank you to Maya and Astra and Fiona for coming from all ends of the earth, um, <laughs> from, from Rhodes in Greece and from Michigan in America and from Devon. Um, which is a world away from us in Cornwall. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, congratulations, Fiona, on the book and Anupa. It really is a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, uh, there are links in the chat if anyone wants to pick it up. It's all, all on our website. Um, there's a couple of, of poems and lots of pictures and things like that if you want to have a look at it before, beforehand too. Um, it's also worth mentioning, one of the questions I would have asked Fiona is about collaboration. Um, and if you want to see some of the other iterations the text has taken, it's... Um, I should have asked Fiona about this to, to mention it before, but it, uh, there's there have been as uh, it's uh, Mayor, Bol Mayor Bosworth um, and there's another sound artist who Fiona's worked with on creating uh, films and, and, and sound art work. Uh, that if you do a quick Google search of it, you'll you'll be able to find, and it's all really really stunning, and it's great to see the um, the words in, in these different contexts and and emerging in these different forms. And uh, I think we at Gillamot have been really really grateful to be able to work on the. Um, the book version of them. So thank you very much, Fiona. So again, thank you, Astra. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Hopefully we'll see you at the next event.